I know you're going to dig this. Well, hello, hello, and welcome, welcome, everybody, to the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles, recorded live from DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio, zooming all the way in from Stockton, California. We have the bass man himself, Mr. Rusty Allen. Rusty, thank you so much for joining us, man. We're looking forward to talking with you today and finding out about your career, what you've done in the past, what you're doing currently. So how are you this good day? Oh, man, what a blessing it is to be here with you, Skip. Uh, I consider it a, an honor, man, and a privilege to even be considered for this show. Thank you. I'm, I'm fine, though. I uh, did my 10-mile bike ride, which I do every morning about 6.37 in the morning because all the gyms are closed, mm -hmm. and I'm rapidly gaining weight <laughs> but i'm good <laughs> aren't we all huh? yeah. <laughs> all right well hey let's go ahead and start from the beginning rusty you know where are you from we'll start from that and then we'll move into what got you interested in the bass guitar okay well um uh i was born in monroe louisiana and uh i'm the third son born on the third day the third month so it was like five of us then we came to California, I guess about, uh, I must have been about three years old. And we moved to this community in Oakland by the name of Sobrani Park. And there I went to elementary school, junior high school, and went to Castlemont High School in Oakland and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. All right. So when did you get your first bass? What was your inspiration to pick up the bass? Well, um, Actually, my first bass wasn't a bass at all. It was a guitar, and and we all had guitars, uh, but somebody had to play the low notes, so I would play the first four strings of the guitar, <laughs> and that was the bass, you know, but I actually uh, got a real bass. My mother bought me a St. George bass, uh, which is a, which was a cheap Fender copy, but it was, it was decent for the time, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so who were some of your influences, whether they be bass players or not, but who were some of your influences? Well, you know, just music in general was my influence at that point because uh, my mom and dad, they would have these bit whist parties at night, right? And they would have friends over and, and it was quite different then. They would dress up and put on ties and everything and they'd have their cocktails and they'd be playing bit whist. So uh, I'd have on my little pajamas and everything and you know, my mother would, you know, tell me, Rusty, it's time to go to bed. And I was like, Mom, please, please, just let me let, lay by the stereo. I won't make any noise. I won't do anything. And I would fall asleep in front of the stereo. Mm -hmm. And they were playing Ray Charles, and they were playing uh, Howlin' Wolf, and they were playing uh, John Lee Hooker, and uh, all of these great, you know, blues and jazz artists. And I just became just absorbed with that. Mm-hmm. Okay, so did you play in various bands along the way? Well, you know, I, I picked up an instrument, uh, I guess I must have been about 12. What happened was uh, my father's brother came over to the house in Sobrani Park and he had an acoustic guitar. And uh, so he was in the bedroom playing these little songs and I would uh, go back there and listen to him. So he played something <clears throat> and uh, he asked me, he said, you think you can do that? And I never touched an instrument in my life. And he said, you think you can do that? And I said, well, let me try. So he hands me the guitar and I immediately copied what he played. And his eyes got wide and he hollered from my mother, Leela, Leela, you got to come in here. And 
show him, show her what you just showed me, right? And so I started playing, and that was the beginning. Okay, all right. But so, we would play. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, and so you know, as the teen years started coming on, then it started getting a little bit more serious, and we would start, you know, playing in little talent shows. Or there was a couple of guys in the Sabrani Park community that had electric guitars, and they would come out on their porch with their amplifier and, you know, play Chuck Berry stuff. And I just thought that was so cool. And I was like, man, I want to do that. I want to do that. So uh, that's where it really began. And from there on to little talent shows and things like that. Mm -hmm. So at what point, Rusty, did you realize, you know what, I can really do something serious with this and take it to the next level? Is there something that happened? Was you in a band or... What happened that made you realize, you know what, I want to do this? Well, what happened, what really started uh, me getting really serious about it was uh, I would listen to Sly Stone on KSOL. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a disc jockey, obviously, and uh, he would play these little songs and make up these little tunes and play the harmonica. And I would tune in to him every night that he was on the radio. And consequently, there were these two girls that lived across the street from me. One's name was Gloria, the other one's name was May. And on any given afternoon, I'd see this 56 Buick or whatever, just big gigantic fins on it and everything, pull into their driveway. And I'd see this guy get out of the car and he had the little Richard Pompadour hairstyle and everything and he'd go to the trunk and he'd open it and grab this case and big long case and I would be like what is that what is that then I found out later on it was a bass but that guy was Larry Graham visiting his girlfriend mm. and at some point I was like I was I was done man I had to do that right so I had some friends in West Oakland that I really started getting serious about playing with and uh having no car or transportation of any kind, I'd have to catch the bus with my St. George bass and my piggyback St. George bass amplifier. And when I think about that today, I just wonder how in the world did I do that? Because uh, it was a ride from deep in East Oakland all the way to downtown Oakland. Then I had to transfer to an 88 to get on the 88 Market Street. So I would just take each piece one at a time and put it on the bus, sit behind the bus driver and you know, same thing, get off, you know, one piece at a time. And then when I got to my final destination, I'd have to take uh, a, take the bass speaker down the street, go back and get the head. And, you know, it was just like uh, in increments of blocks till I got to where I had to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so I had to be pretty serious to go through those changes, man, uh, you know. That was the sacrifice, uh, huh? That was the sacrifice. But uh, I had some good friends in West Oakland and all. Uh, you know, they were good as musicians and, and we would do talent shows and it was just a lot of fun. Man. Mm -hmm. So take us up then. So how did you now actually, you know, become a member of Sly and the Family Stone? Um, when I was a junior in high school, uh, my friends in West Oakland, we would go out and, you know, go to nightclubs and sit in the car because we were too young to get in. We would listen to the greats, you know, uh, Johnny Hartsman and uh, Eugene Blacknell and uh, Johnny Talbot and all these different uh, artists that were holding down the Bay Area. And we'd go to the campus club and we'd listen to Johnny Talbot. And at that time, he was just like, he, you know, he toured with Marvin Gaye. He, he had a really funky thing going on. Uh, and uh, so we were driving down Market Street one day and I looked out the window and I saw this guy getting his shoes shined and I immediately recognized him as Johnny Talbot. So I'm like, man, stop the car, stop the car, stop. And they were like, why? Just stop. So they stopped and I jumped out and I ran up to him. I says, man, I want to play in your band. <laughs> and he was like, man, who's this wild young kid, man? You know, but anyway, he gave me the chance to play in his band and I cut my first records with him. Consequently, Sly Stone knew about this guy too, Johnny Talbot. So what ended up happening was, uh, uh, you know, during the little sister 
um, thing. You know, I was playing with her, and Freddie was like kind of running that. Um, Willie Wilde, who just recently uh, departed this life, he was playing drums, and David Stallings. Uh, we had a little trio, and we'd back up little sister. Uh, so Sly and the Family Stone had a had a show at the Cow Palace in San Francisco, and we all got to go because you know we were like part of the little entourage at that mm -hmm. point. Now, little sister was Sly's sister, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. All right. Yeah. And so that particular night was the night that I believe uh, Larry Graham left because I remember Sly came on, he played about 15 minutes and then he just said, man, I can't take this. And he just left the stage. And so they came off stage and I remember being backstage and I was within about six feet of Larry Graham and Larry Graham had a tambourine and he just threw it as hard as he could. And I mean, he was just totally frustrated. So anyway, at that point, uh, uh, I found out that Larry had told Sly, uh, Jerry Martini, uh, if anyone takes my place, I wanted to be this kid, Rusty, because I I used to go to Larry's house before, uh, you know, that point, and me and Willie and, and David Stallings and Larry would write these little tunes and let us play them, and he recorded, you know, so so Larry knew about me, not just you know through little sister, but personally too. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, uh, Sly went to Johnny Talbot and he said, uh, I just want to let you know I'm going to take your bass player, <laughs> you know, and uh, the rest is, uh, as you say, history. Yeah. So let me ask you this, Rusty, you know, knowing the, the reputation that Sly had begun to develop and, you know, the various dynamics that came with him, did you have some apprehension about joining him, wondering what it was going to be like or, you know, what was your thoughts on that? Um, I never had any apprehension. I remember the first conversation that I had with Sly was on the phone and I was at his parents' house uh, over on Urbano Street in San Francisco. And, uh, you know, his mother put me on the phone and said, Sly, I want to talk to you. So he talked to me and he, he just asked me these questions and I really couldn't understand what he was saying because his voice was so deep and he was talking kind of fast. But every time he stopped talking, I would just say, uh-huh, yeah, mm -hmm. yes, affirmative, yes, whatever you're saying, yes, right? Mm -hmm. And and so uh, next thing I knew, uh, we were in Roanoke, Virginia uh, at a concert with about 25,000 people auditioning. Myself, Warnell Jones, who was the bass player for the Young Senators backing up Eddie Kendricks, and this other guy, this uh, white dude, um, with this big, you know, full white beard and everything, right? It looked like Santa Claus. And so we all played and uh, uh, Sly uh, kind of made a joke like, I'm gonna hire the white guy and just, you know, put him in a Santa Claus suit <laughs> and call him Santa Claus, but he was just kidding, right? Anyway, I got the gig um, and the rest is history. Right. So, you know, tell our, our viewers, uh, what albums did you play on? What songs did you play on? I mean, I know which ones they are because, you know, Rusty, the first time that I ever saw Sly in the Family Stone, you were the bass player. You know? Of course, I was I was young, yeah. <laughs> as we Me all too. were. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, but, but that particular show was a good show, though. You know what? So, yeah, the shows were up and down, but, you know, like I was fortunate enough to play on the uh, – Fresh album. I had some cuts on the Small Talk album. I had a mm -hmm. couple of cuts on um, what was that? High on You album. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and um, a lot of times, you know, we would like piecemeal bass parts, or Sly would play something and say, "Okay, Russ, you play this," and I'd play it, and or he would he would just let me go, and then he'd like fix the little things that I would, you know, uh, miss, you know, because. I mean, his concept was total. I mean, when he heard a song, he heard everything. I mean, he heard the horn lines, he heard the bass line, melody, everything. So, I mean, uh, uh, a, a person like that who is masterful at every instrument uh, can put down exactly what he's hearing in his head, right? So mm -hmm. um, so it, it was challenging at, at points, but, you know, bottom line was it was just so funky and a lot of fun and 
I just loved being around him, you know, and just, you know, trying to emulate what he was doing, man. I mean, he was just the coolest cat that I ever knew. Right, right. Yeah. So how long were you with him? And what led to you no longer working with Sly and the Family Stone? I, I got in Sly's band, I believe, somewhere at the end of 70, uh, 70 early 71. Um, and I stayed there, I think, maybe four and a half years. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, man, he treated me so good. I mean, he treated me like I was a blood brother. I mean, I was like I was part of the family. And, he, you know, he had a special affection for me and me for him. You know, I was like, man, this is the coolest guy in the world, right? So... Uh, but after a while, um, things started getting kind of weird, you know, uh, certain drugs were being experimented with and which was causing certain reactions that, uh, I didn't think were healthy. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, maybe it's time to move on. Fortunately, Aunt Bubba Banks felt the same weight, so to speak, and he pulled Rose out. And so we went to Motown and we did the uh, whole new thing album. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So other than Sly, who else have you worked with? Well, um, uh, people of note, uh, Robin Trower was, uh, was the thing that I stepped into after Sly. And uh, I got to tell you, man, I, I got just as much satisfaction out of playing in that band as I did with Sly in the, in the sense that it was very musical, it was very high energy. You know, I was uh, a Jimi Hendrix nut. And, you know, if I'd had a, had the opportunity to play with Jimi, that's where I would have really went. You know, I mean, everything about him, man, Hendrix, I, you know, I was like him and Sly were the cats to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I ended up uh, moving over to London for about a year and a half and uh, toured with Robin Trower. Uh, and that lasted from about 76 to 78. Mm -hmm. All right. After that, it was like, I had my own band, um, Second Wind, which uh, was a really good local group. Uh, Bonnie Boyer, she was the female vocalist. She ended up going with Prince. Mm -hmm. um, but as a band, we uh, were, getting some notoriety as a matter of fact to the point to where bernard edward came and saw us play live at a at a club called the white house in oakland and shortly after that we were in new york at the power station cutting demos with bernard edwards producing mm -hmm. yeah from and, chic. Uh, yeah man mm -hmm. and you know he brought he brought in uh steve ferrone to do the drum tracks and oh man it was just great and mm -hmm. I, mean, I was just wow it was i was loving that so uh, with Robin Trower, and then you know, after the after the second win thing, uh, just you know, playing here and there, here and there, until uh, Greg Crockett called me for the Bobby Womack thing, and I think that was around '96, mm -hmm. and uh, I got with Bobby and uh, stayed with him till the end. Mm -hmm. All right, that's been about 19 to 20 years. Wow, yeah. yeah. So I want to step back for a quick second. Uh, According to your understanding of things, what was it that that forced Larry, you know, out of Sly and the Family Stone? According to well, your understanding. Well, according to my understanding, uh, there was there was some animosity uh, going on uh, between Sly and Larry. What the exact uh, cause of that animosity was, I I didn't know, but uh, you know, I had. I heard that Larry had felt threatened. Um, you know, he was dating Rose for a while and then Bubba came into the mix and he started, you know, seeing Rose. And there was just, uh, from what I understand, there was, uh, uh, Larry had a fear basically for his life and, you know, he felt like, you know, he had to leave. Oh. Uh, the exact cause of that, I couldn't tell you, Skip, but those right. are pretty, uh, from pretty reliable sources, um, mm -hmm. but I just told you is what is why. Right, right. So, uh, have you maintained the you know communication relationship with Larry through the years? Uh, I saw Larry um, play at a club called Yoshi's in San Francisco on yeah. Fillmore, and my band uh, had a band called Housequake at the time, and we were in the front room, and Larry was in the back, and 
we saw each other and hugged and it's like, you know, you know, we have really, you know, we're cool, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Freddie, I talked to Freddie uh, all the time. We text and everything. And uh, uh, I'm pretty much in touch with Freddie a lot still, mm-hmm. you know, for, for spiritual uh, development and musical stuff. As a matter of fact, you know, we had went to, uh, uh, to Strawberry Ranch and we cut about 11 songs. Uh, and everyone was there. Freddie, Greg, Rose, Cynthia, Jerry, myself. Uh, and we, we, you know, we recorded some nice stuff, uh, but, uh, Suzanne DePass, uh, kind of had to come into the mix because our financial backer, he was a General Motors mogul and the stock market crashed. And so he couldn't keep paying salaries. So she got involved and, Mm -hmm. uh, Freddie had had some dealings with her in the past. So when she asked us to be the first act on, Showtime at the Apollo, which she had, you know, bought the contract and the rights to. Freddie didn't want to do it. So that kind of like fell through. Right, right. And so uh, Cynthia's, Cynthia Robinson's contribution to Sly, uh, how much of a contribution did she make from your affiliation with him? Oh, wow. I mean, she was, she was essential. I mean, her energy, her, uh, her focus, her chops on trumpet. I mean, I mean, what female plays trumpet, man, in a funk band? You know what I mean? <laughs> that to me, that was like a first. Uh, mm-hmm. But no, she, she, she's just true blue, just so real and down to earth and everything. And she speaks her mind, and you know, she'll give you some tough love if she needs to. But um, mm-hmm. she was such a sweet person. And uh, shortly before she passed, uh, I was able to like get to the hospital and lean over her. And nose to nose, eyeball to eyeball, and she opened her eyes. She said, "Rusty," right? <laughs> and then a couple of days later, she was gone. But at least I knew that she saw me before she left this earth. Okay. Well, so, do do you still have any contact uh, or updated information on Sly himself? Um. Well, uh, we did the Grammys, um, the Grammy thing in two thousand six. And uh, after that, uh, uh, Barry Freeman, Crittenden Freeman, and uh, Greg Artis and some other people, they put together the Sly and the Family Stone Convention at the uh, Fox uh, Theater in Oakland. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how long ago that was, but that was the most recent that I had seen Sly. And I almost missed him because uh, after they did their panel discussion and question and answer and everything, Sly was leaving it. I was like, where'd he go? Where'd he go? He said, he's leaving. So I ran outside and he was, the, the limo driver was shut, getting ready to shut the door. And I jumped in the car and hugged him. And, mm-hmm. you know, we smiled at each other and it was beautiful, man. Just All right. Okay. Yeah. So, Rusty, what do you have going on currently? Well, you know, I've been just really blessed with a lot of stuff, man. Uh, I'm doing a remix of my first uh, solo uh, album, uh, simple rules. Uh, we've been remixing that. Levi Caesar from Princeton, the Power Generations band, has been like overseeing the uh, arranging and production and and uh, recording. Uh, and I, I, I'm really happy with the outcome. Uh, right now, we have a single out. Do what you want to do, and it's doing very well uh, overseas. Uh, uh, DJ Sean and. DJ Honeycutt, people in North Carolina and Texas and all over there playing it. Uh, yeah, and, and then uh, there's a video that goes along with uh, Do What You Want to Do. That's, that's kind of fun thing that uh, uh, we should be releasing soon. Uh, my son, DeMarco Allen, uh, did the animation on there. There's some uh, cartoon animation in there, and then there's some club scenes, and just a funky good time. You know, my whole thing is like just having fun and dancing, you know, and uh, enjoying life. You know, that's that's the message I want to send out. Just have a good time, man. All right. So the other members of Sly, uh, you still have any contact with them? You know what they're up to? Um, not really. I saw Jerry Martini a couple of years ago. He brought the uh, Family Stone out to a, a venue uh, not far from Stockton, uh, 
to a city called Livermore, California. So I drove out there and went to the sound check. Uh, I had actually played in Jerry's band for a while. Uh, uh, and and it was it was pretty good. Billy Shoes Johnson was playing drums. You know, he was formerly with Maze and mm-hmm. you know, uh myself, Cynthia and Jerry was there. Uh this guy Tosh Cryer was playing keyboards. Uh, mm-hmm. uh Charles Charles, uh my, my buddy Charlie um uh, was playing guitar. Uh Fred Ross was doing the lead vocals and it was it was a fun band. Mm-hmm. What about uh uh the former drummer Greg Arico? Uh, I don't see Greg too much. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, I don't see Greg too much. Uh, I know Bill Lorden has a, a a page on Facebook, and you know I I see his posts, and sometimes I'll uh, you know respond to his posts. Uh, mm-hmm. But the only person that I'm really in touch with on any type of regular basis is Freddie. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you know, Rusty, you've been around a while. You you know the music industry from the 70s up to it currently. You know, what do you like about the music business today and what don't you like about it? Well, first of all, man, they got bass players out there now that have just raised the bar, man, uh, incredibly from what I was doing as Mm -hmm. far as playing funk bass. I mean, it's just incredible. But, you know, I really love the gospel genre right now. I mean, there's some fantastic players. I mean, those guys are killing it. And then I have... Uh, I have love for like you know guys like Hadrian Ferrard and and Henry Glender and uh, uh, Derek Bennett. I mean, there's just some fabulous bass players out there. Uh, Victor Wooten, you know, uh, and I can go on and on. But uh, as far as as you know, music is concerned, um, obviously hip hop is dominating. But uh, there's some good stuff out there. Uh, uh, and then there's some bad stuff out there. I mean, you know, a lot of a lot of producers are, are are finding ways to produce some decent music without even having to have any knowledge of playing an instrument. You know, they have programs out there that have, you know, chord progressions. These beautiful chord progressions. All you have to do is touch a button and, you know, put them where you want them. And just, you know, I mean, the skill level it's it's a skill level involved there, but it's it's totally different from having to go into a studio and playing a song from the beginning to the end, uh, you know, physically, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, you know, there's, then there was a situation where you might have to punch in a part, you know, but uh, basically you had to cut the track from beginning to end. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, you know, you can go on coffee music, man. And, you know, you see cats like Mono Neon and Ghost Note and Snarky Puppy and all those guys. And, you know, I just love all of that. Mm-hmm. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, it sent me back to school. I'm at Delta College. I'm going on my third semester of uh, theory with Aaron Garner, and I'm uh, been playing upright bass uh, with Brian Kendrick. You know, leading the jazz ensemble there. School's getting ready to start back Monday. I'm, it's going to be kind of strange, man, because we, we we had to zoom our last classes and everything. So it's not like being there physically, but I'll deal with it. Mm-hmm. Well, it seems great that even all that you've done and accomplished, uh, but you're you're still trying to progress and move forward with your craft. I think I think that's to be commendable. Thank you. Yeah, um, it's a lifetime endeavor, man. I mean, you know, uh, you just for me, you just don't do something that okay, that's it, and then you know what I know is what I know. I mean, I've always uh, want to be a better player than I ever considered myself to be. And Mm -hmm. uh, that the quest for that will never end. I will never, you know, acquiesce to the fact that, okay, that's it. You're good. Uh, You know, even if I'm terrible on upright, I'm going to be playing some upright bass somewhere, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. So why don't you let all of our viewers know, you know, how they can stay in touch with you. Just check out what you're doing. you got some social media website or, any particular contacts you want to direct people to? Yes, uh, anyone uh, interested in any type of uh, future booking or anything like that can contact Barry Crittenden Freeman. Uh, he's on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well, and I have a website, rustyallen.com. Um, yeah, download my single. Do what you want to do. It's very funky and very happy, and it's some it's some good stuff on there. Freddie's Freddie's uh, on guitar, and uh, 
it, it's it's a like a little little fun funk thing to dance to i think okay all right well of course now rusty you know uh in existence now is the funk music hall of fame and exhibition center and of right. course you know part of its purpose and mission is to preserve the legacy of this genre we call funk you know are you in support of that do you agree with it being in a place like dayton ohio absolutely i mean dayton man some some great musicians came out of dayton ohio man i mean you know I, my boys are from uh <laughs> Uh, uh, Ohio players, man, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, and and that that genre, man, uh, because of that genre, funk is what it is today. Uh, you know, I mean, it's it's uh, taken over a lot of uh, a musicians' mindsets from male and female. I mean, now you see girls on bass just killing, you know, funk bass and stuff now, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that definitely needs to preserve so everyone will understand. That what you guys are doing today is because of what happened yesterday right. and the guys that performed it. Yeah, to yeah. definitely keep that legacy going, sure. All right. And of course, you know, I'm going to throw this out. If you have some paraphernalia, something that you could potentially devote to the Funk Center, I know the CEO, Mr. David Webb, would appreciate that. If you got something that you feel you could denote, I mean, donate, excuse me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I will definitely uh, look into that. Yeah. Okay. Well, Rusty. We want to thank you so much, man, for coming on, taking some time, uh, sharing your experiences with us, your involvement with Sly and the Family Stone, as well as others. But once again, we know Sly is, is a name that will be etched in history as far as the contributions that he and that band made, you know, to the world of music. So uh, thank you so much for coming on. Please, much success to all of your future endeavors. And uh, we look forward to staying in touch with you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to be in touch with you because I need some airplay. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll talk yes, about sir. it. All right. Yes, sir. Okay. okay, cool. Okay, well, Rusty, you have a great rest of the day and be safe, you and yours. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. You have been watching the Funk Music Hall of Fame and Exhibition Center's award-winning show, Funk Chronicles recorded live from DATV Studios in Dayton, Ohio. I'm Skip, your phonologist. Thank you for joining us. Everybody, please be safe. And until next time, keep it funky. You can do what you want to do. You can do it.